Good afternoon. <laughs> well, we'll try that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's better. I'm Barb Wilson, the president of the University of Iowa, and it's a great honor to welcome all of you today to the 38th annual presidential lecture. It's a gorgeous day outside, and I'm really grateful that you've all decided to come inside to hear this exciting presentation and to spend some time with us today. So thank you. And thanks to those joining us by Zoom. We're really grateful. Let's take a moment to thank our musicians before they leave for their wonderful performance. You just heard Jorge Montija Moreno and Stephen Mulvihill, both from the UI School of Music. We're so grateful for their incredible performance. Thank you. I'd like to make a special note that the composer of the last piece, Florence Price, was the first African-American woman to be recognized as a symphonic composer and to have her piece played by a major orchestra, her first symphony, performed in 1933 by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Pretty phenomenal. Yes, let's do that. I want to mention that there are note cards available for audience members to ask questions, and uh, they should be somewhere around where you're sitting. If you want to jot a question down, that would be great, and staff members will collect those cards once Ted's lecture is completed. And he asks that you also, if you don't mind, put your email address on those cards so if we run out of time, he can actually answer your questions personally afterwards. So that's just an example of who we have giving our lecture today. Uh, President James O. Friedman established the presidential lecture series 38 years ago, and the lecture showcases outstanding faculty members from across the entire university. It serves to encourage communication across disciplinary boundaries, and it brings the work of our faculty scholars to the general public. I am so very pleased to introduce to you our 38th presidential lecturer, Ted Abel, of the Carver College of Medicine. Ted also holds the title of director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute. He's a professor, chair, and DEO of neuroscience and pharmacology, and he holds a Roy J. Carver chair in neuroscience. So lots of titles uh, that are cer certainly well-deserved. Your program lists a lot of Ted's impressive scholarly accomplishments, so I'm not going to repeat those. Instead, I'm going to give you a sense of the kind of person Ted is, if you don't already know. And many of the examples I'm going to share with you, I think, capture what a superb researcher, teacher, and leader Ted is, and what a personal person he is, what a, uh, an outstanding individual he is. So let me give you some examples, and I hope these won't embarrass you, Ted. I don't think they will. We talked to many of your fans. Uh, Kumar Narayanan said, uh, he, uh, who is an associate professor of neurology and an associate director in the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, sums up Ted's impact well, and I quote, Ted has been a transformative leader here at Iowa, bringing together neuroscience with singular vision. Kumar also notes that Ted's work makes, quote, a tangible impact for patients and their families on a range of brain diseases. John Wemmy, professor of psychiatry and also an associate director in the Neuroscience Institute, notes how swift Ted's impact has been here at Iowa, marveling at, quote, how tirelessly he can work. With amazing speed, he says, Ted has advanced neuroscience on every front I can imagine. His efforts and his progress in just over four years boggle my mind. Joshua Weiner, professor of biology and an institute associate director as well, emphasizes Ted's wide-ranging intellect. He's not just a science nerd. He is a musician. Josh notes that Ted plays the clarinet, reflected in his choice for our musical prelude, and is now learning alto saxophone. Josh also praises Ted's love of poetry and literature, and the two are working together as co-editors on a neuroscience book series with the University of Iowa Press. 
Nearly everyone agrees on Ted's deep humanity as one of his most distinguishing characteristics, especially throughout his mentorship. Tomas Nickel Yakshat, excuse me, associate professor of psychiatry and someone who began working with Ted as a young postdoc says that, quote, Ted has made a lot of excellent contributions to various fields of science, but his mentorship has founded its own school of thought that will extend way beyond his immediate body of work in the future. At the center of that mentorship, Josh Weiner also says, it's Ted's, quote, big heart, empathy, and an ingrained sense of, of justice that characterizes who he is. Marie Gain, who was Ted's lab manager for four years before launching her own lab as an assistant professor in the UI College of Pharmacy in the past year, says, Ted has a Mayo Angelou uh, Angelo, quote, printed on his office wall that says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I can definitely say he made me feel like a scientist and someone who could go out into the world and conquer anything. He goes to a lot of effort to make people feel included, needed, and capable. Emily Walsh, is a current graduate student and works in Ted's lab. She says, Ted is empathetic. He cares a lot about the healthy mindset of his trainees and takes the time to make sure I and others are doing well. Ted has always emphasized that the most important thing for doing science in his lab is not your background or original field of study. It is that you have a drive to learn and you are motivated to do good work. Neuroscience graduate student Alexander Pachucci says Ted is the most down-to-earth person of his stature. He regularly checks in with students and is always patient and kind. That patience and kindness have come out at least a couple of times with Alex. Once when she dropped an entire box of empty styrofoam boxes on him while he was giving some donors a tour of the Papa John Medical, Biomedical Discovery Building, which he still teases her about today. And maybe even more dramatically, Ted was nothing but calming and understanding when a very nervous Alex opened a can of soda before her comp exam, which exploded all over the table, her computer, and her clothes. Alex ended up doing her presentation in a very casual horse riding outfit, the only change of clothes she had with her. And Ted said he was very impressed that she was able to perform well under those very difficult circumstances. As Alex says, Ted sees the good in us. He doesn't judge. We are so fortunate to have such a nationally and internationally renowned, accomplished, inspiring, and caring researcher, teacher, and mentor here on our faculty at the University of Iowa. I am so honored to introduce this year's presidential lecture. Please welcome Ted Abel. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I probably should stop while I'm ahead. Uh, and it's funny, Alex and, and Thomas are both in the front row. It's hard to see anybody. But I, so don't throw anything, Alex, okay? Uh, I, I want to I uh, firstly especially thank uh, Jorge Montilla, who's, uh, I don't know if he's still here, but um, I, uh, I try to play the clarinet. And uh, Jorge helped me navigate a piece, Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, that we played before the pandemic with the Carver College of Medicine Orchestra, the faculty, student, and staff orchestra. My, my fellow clarinetist uh, was also a neuroscientist. He's now a, a resident in neurology, and uh, it, was, it was terrific. It's a great group to play with. I hope we'll be back after the pandemic, and, and Jorge really helped me navigate, navigate that musically. It was terrific to hear their uh, lyrical and expressive work from uh, Bernstein, which is a very kind of fireworky sort of piece for clarinet, uh, to The Price, which was um, really much, much more lyrical. So, so thanks so much, Jorge and Stephen.
And let me also thank uh, President Wilson for the honor of delivering this presidential lecture, and, and two deans of the Carver College of Medicine, uh, Jean Robillard and Brooks Jackson, whose vision and support have enabled what I'm going to talk about today uh, in the Iowa Neuroscience Institute. So what I hope to tell you about today is our work on sleep and memory, and to put that in perspective, in the perspective of the larger problem of how, how it is that all of these cells in our head actually enable us to think and feel and communicate and play the clarinet. They're problems that, have, uh, that were uh, thought about by Plato, they were thought about by Proust, and they've been drawn about by Pixar animators. And I'll tell you uh, a little bit about them uh, today. So in three pounds of tissue, the human brain contains 86 billion neurons, each of which makes 10,000 synaptic connections that combine to give rise to our memories, our actions, and our emotions. So we have a very daunting task ahead of us to think about how these electrical signals that curse through the, the neurons in our brain then turn into chemical signals at each of the connections between nerve cells called synapses. How it is that they enable us to remember. Uh, here, uh, here uh, described by, uh, by Salvador Dali, let me see if I can actually use this pointer. Here's a bit of plasticity in action, which is me trying to use a new, a new device here. We'll, we'll see what happens. Anyway, but uh, um, Salvador Dali here in his uh, persistence of memory, where he portrays memory as a time. Marcel Proust, who tastes a Madeleine and uh, then remembers his aunt and the kitchen and their village where she lived. To uh, the animators at Pixar who represented memories as balls, balls that change color when they are happy memories and they can be changed to, to sad memories as well. We've developed in recent years a number of tools uh, largely driven by the Brain Initiative uh, at the uh, National Institutes of Health and uh, the Department of Defense and NSF. Those tools enable us to image neural circuits. You can see a human brain uh, over here in the uh, upper, upper um, left. And, um, uh, you, over here, and I've, I've highlighted a region called the hippocampus that I will focus on. We can look at cells within the hippocampus and stain them various colors. We can go through an entire brain and, and look at circuits. What you see in this video comes from our neural circuits and behavior core in the INI from Shane Heine there, who's the director. And this is from a mouse line in which neurons have been labeled to fluoresce. We can literally reconstruct and visualize them throughout the entire brain. And very recent technology from our neurobank and uh, Queen Lynn there is a techn technology called spatial transcriptomics where we can look at gene expression across slices of brain tissue. And to me, what has been very attractive about neuroscience is that throughout, it's been intriguing to authors and philosophers and poets. Uh, there's a, a play written about five years ago by Tom Stoppard, who you may know as the author of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, a sort of follow-up to Hamlet. And in The Hard Problem, a woman, Hillary, starts as a psychology major and does a PhD in psychology, then moves to a neuroscience institute, of all places, to do her postdoc, where she learns techniques called optogenetics here, reflected in the blueness, the blue lasers, to activate and regulate neurons. She then finds that unsatisfactory and in the end winds up as a philosopher. So I'm, I'm not sure if we may eventually wind up with the Iowa Philosophy Institute at the end of this, but that would be, that would be a, fun, uh, a fun accomplishment if, if uh, if, if we do. So with all of this complexity, um, you might be thinking that understanding the brain is a bit like understanding a Jackson Pollock painting. Hopefully we will uh, soon have this Pollock painting back uh, in the Stanley Museum of Art a, uh, a few blocks away from here. Looking forward to that. It's had its tour of the world uh, for sure. One of the things that's that's distinct from the Pollock painting. People do things like x-ray this painting to figure out whether it was cut to fit in a Guggen space in Guggenheim's house or, or what happens, happened to it. But in neuroscience, we can get under the hood. We can take the brain apart. We can try to put it back together again. We can image it and we can manipulate it. 
And a striking example of that comes from the work of a graduate student that President Wilson mentioned, uh, Emily Walsh, pictured in the right there. What Emily has done in this, experiment, in this experiment is to take advantage of some techniques to control neural circuits uh, at will. And she expressed a particular gene in a piece of the brain called the lateral hypothalamus, uh, deep in the bottom of the brain. And it, uh, that area of the brain controls a number of properties, including uh, feeding and homeostasis and blood pressure and heart rates, but also sleep, something that I'll talk about in my lecture uh, today. And what Emily expressed there was a new kind of receptor, an engineered receptor uh, called a DRED, uh, and that is a designer receptor exclusively activated for designer drugs. We'll, uh, we'll have a quiz later, so if you have your uh, index cards, you might want to write that down. But what the DRED does is enable us to give animals a drug, and when we give them that drug, any cell expressing the DRED will be activated. And so what Emily did was to go in and activate these neurons in the lateral hypothalamus. And what she found is that at this time of day, normally animals are asleep. Their level of wakefulness is only at 40%. But if these neurons in the lateral hypothalamus are stimulated here in this red line, these animals are awake, spending 100% of their time awake, measured by electrical brain signals. And so we can activate lateral hypothalamus and cause animals to wake up. One of our faculty members in neuroscience and pharmacology, Dennis Atazoy, who we hired several years ago, an assistant professor, he was one of the first people as a postdoc to do some of these experiments to regulate feeding circuits, where he could express particular genes and activate circuits, other circuits than these in the hypothalamus, and animals would stop whatever they would do and go and eat. Um, unfortunately, he did not identify the alternative circuits uh, to stop the animals from eating, but it's still a, dr a dramatic exercise of, have, of enabling basically uh, external control of behavior that reflects how well we understand how many of these neural circuits work. What we're particularly interested in in the Iowa Neuroscience Institute is how these alterations in neural circuits give rise to brain disorders. Brain disorders like autism uh, that affect uh, uh, more than one in 50 of our children. Brain disorder like Parkinson's disease, and you can see Michael J. Fox and the impact he has had with this foundation. Brain disorders like Alzheimer's and brain disorders like schizophrenia, all of which we're studying here in the Iowa Neuroscience Institute at the University of Iowa. These brain disorders are costly, not just to the individuals who suffer from them and to their families, but to society at large. They account for over 20% of disability, and they cost over $1 trillion in the United States each year. They often involve chronic care, and we have no cures, and we have few treatments. One of the things that's uh, an important thing to note is with COVID, we think of COVID as a respiratory disease, largely uh, driven by uh, respiratory symptoms. But in terms of COVID itself, and also especially long COVID, there are a number of neurological and psychiatric sequelae of COVID infections, and we're just beginning uh, to define that. And so this impact is, is only increasing uh, with, with each year. So the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, with the support of the Carver Charitable Trust, the Carver College of Medicine, was founded to try to take revolutionary discoveries in fundamental neuroscience that we accomplish in our labs and to translate these into clinical treatments for disorders of the brain and nervous system. Over the past five years, We've made uh, extraordinary progress. In addition to the $45 million gift from the Roy J. Carver Charitable Trust, we've obtained additional philanthropic support from the university, thanks to the University of Iowa Center for Advancement, of over $55 million. So we've, in, we've nearly, we've more than doubled the Carver Trust original gift. I and I faculty members are impressive in bringing in over $85 million in grant funding a year. These 120 faculty come from seven colleges and 30 departments. It's an extraordinarily diverse group. And we've been able to help hire 20 new faculty members since 2016 in 11 departments across the university, and half of those hires were women. With the 
Department of Biology and the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Um, Josh Weiner mentioned earlier he's pictured here in action at the uh, Iowa State Fair, I think. Uh, and Josh uh, helped start the undergraduate neuroscience major, which now has over 275 students. Our first hire here, Crystal Parker, I believe I saw her earlier, and uh, she worked with uh, Nancy Andreasen and Kumar Narayanan and is an associate, assistant professor now. We've had outreach events that included Roseanne Cash talking about music in the brain. We've been able to get Herky into the lab. We, we see him a lot on the athletic field. We rarely see him in the lab. I think this may be the, one of the very few pictures of Herky in a lab coat. So thanks to Josh and the Department of Biology for getting Herky into a lab coat. And more recently, very recently, the latest Rhodes Scholar from the University of Iowa, Marissa Muller, uh, is, is a bioengineering major and a javelin uh, thrower with the track team. Marissa is now at Oxford and she's doing an MSc in neuroscience. After she completes uh, her MSc in neuroscience, she will be going to Harvard where she will do an MD, PhD in, in neuroscience as well. So neuroscience has, uh, has really impacted her and I, I was a Marshall Scholar uh, and studied in England and I was able to help Marissa as she was putting her applications together. And it's terrific uh, to see uh, her, her success. Very recently, um, we received a grant from the National Institute of Child Health and Human, uh, uh, Human Development uh, for an Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center that Lane Strathairn and I uh, co-direct uh, in the Center for Disabilities and Development and the Department of Pediatrics. And this center was, was, just, was just funded this past summer and hopefully will soon be an official center uh, supported by the Board of Regents. So I've talked about a lot about what Iowa is doing now and in the past few years, but it is important to realize that neuroscience at Iowa has an extraordinarily rich history, going back uh, to the 1890s. Our Department of Psychology was one of the first in the country, as was our Department of Neurology. Carl Seashore um, established the Psychopathic Hospital, and he was one of the people present at Freud's only visit to the United States, Clark University. So there's a picture of, of a Seashore with William James and a Freud and other, uh, other uh, luminaries in psychology at the time. Uh, Kenneth Spence, uh, who, was, uh, uh, it, who was building one of the buildings in the Psychological Brain Sciences Department, is named for. Uh, in the 50s, there were really a couple ways animals could learn. If they learned uh, through the, the way that whether they turned left or right, then they were based on what Spence and Hull, an investigator at Yale, were studying. Or if they learned about an orienting space, where they were in space, they were uh, learning based on studies of Tolman at Berkeley. There were really two major groups of psychology and behavioral psychology uh, in, in, the mid, in the 50s. George Winokur, um, whose daughter Pat Winokur is the executive dean of the Carver College of Medicine, he was the father of the diagnostic and statistical manual that laid out psychiatric diagnoses. Uh, the Damasios, Hannah and Antonio Damasio, in neurology defined the function of, of a number of brain regions with their patient, pa patient registry. Nancy Andreasen identified schizophrenia as a brain disorder, and that identification was critically dependent on physicists, physicists that helped her develop imaging technology that was revolutionary at the time, uh, PET imaging and later MRI imaging. Uh, more recently, our neuroscience graduate program here, Emily has a, is, has a couple of pictures, here's Emily again uh, in action in the lab, um, is, is 35 years old or so, and uh, more recently, Peg Nopolis was named the first uh, female chair of the Department of Psychiatry. So while the Neuroscience Institute started five years ago, the neuroscience at Iowa has been making an impact uh, for more than 100 years. What I would like to do, do next is talk to you about the work in my lab and what I've been interested in uh, since my lab started. What I'll be talking about is work, it was astounding to sort of look back on it. It's work that began in 1998 when I started my lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's involved some uh, 25 grad students and 15 postdocs and over 100 undergraduates uh, in that time at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Iowa. The problem that has fascinated me since I started as a postdoctoral fellow is the problem of the persistence of memory. 
uh, reflected in several works by Salvador Dali that you see at the bottom of the slide. How is it that this neural circuitry in the brain, these electrical signals and these chemical signals can give rise to memories that are maintained for months and even years? Uh, and how is it that these neural circuits can be plastic and respond to experience? And we're also interested in how our knowledge of these molecular mechanisms may enable us to understand neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative, and psychiatric disorders. So over the, the first experimental studies of memory were carried out by Herming Ebbinghaus in the 1880s, about the time psychology was started here at the University of Iowa. And what Ebbinghaus did in his lab in Göttingen is start to study how memory worked. And over the 100, 130 years since those experiments were started, researchers have really come across what have been three major aspects of the properties of memory storage that I want to first highlight. The first is that there are multiple stages of memory. Memory isn't just an instantaneous thing that happens. It's encoded by hearing lectures like uh, today, or if you're a mouse, studying some objects in this, in this arena. And then after you were to leave this lecture, or if you're a mouse going back to your home cage, uh, you can sleep on it and consolidate those memories and make them stronger. You don't just stabilize them, but they can also be modified. And one of the dramatic things is how much memories can be modified after the initial encoding process. Memories are then tested in retrieval, which we all have experienced in a test. Our, our, my son has an environmental sciences lab test tomorrow, so he'll be retrieving memory he was uh, cramming in this afternoon, but it's also true that the retrieval can change those memories, which is very, very interesting. So memory has multiple stages is the first principle that we have learned. The second principle that we have learned is that there are multiple types of memory, something that I want to uh, illustrate uh, by thinking about Emma Raducanu, uh, who won the U.S. Open uh, this earlier this year at the age of 18. Now, obviously, as a, a, a champion, a Grand Slam champion, uh, Radicanu has exceptional motor skills and timing, driven by brain circuits like the striatum and cerebellum. Winning the trophy here, here uh, she's seen with the US Open trophy, is an emotional memory, driven by circuits in a brain region called the amygdala. If we then ask ourselves, okay, well, Okay, so she's a, a British winner of the US Open. Who was the last one? Well, we might have to go look that up or somebody might remember that it was Virginia Wade in 1968 who was the last woman, Brit British woman to win uh, the US Open. And that memory of an event is driven by the brain region that my lab focuses on, the hippocampus. Researchers, including the Damasios, have found that the hippocampus mediates a selective kind of memory called episodic memory. Memory uh, like remembering that Virginia Wade won a particular tournament or remembering that you just met a particular person that you hadn't seen in a while maybe as you came in the door here and you can talk to them at the reception afterwards. We test that in patients with this funny little figure where we ask uh, patients to draw copy a figure called a Ray Osteroik figure. And then we ask them about 15 or 20 minutes later to draw it from memory. And what you can see is that a patient with a lesion in the hippocampus, uh, shown here, you can see this part of the brain missing that's circled in red, a patient uh, with a hippocampal lesion would not be able to remember details of this figure while a control subject would. I have to say, if any of you feel the way I do, I would not be the control subject in this case. I, I would remember the smiley face. Um, I don't know what else I would get. I haven't actually given this to myself. I've given myself some other tests, but I, I hesitate to do this. So the Damasios collected a, 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 a group of patients that had lesions in different brain regions as the, a result of stroke or surgery, and were able to define the particular functions of the hippocampus, the amygdala, the striatum, the cerebellum in these different types of memory that I talked about. So there are multiple stages of memory. There are multiple types of memory. The third important uh, point that we have learned, and this really came about uh, much more recently, and that is that it is the connections between neurons, which are called synapses. It's the strength of those synapses that mediate memory. So I showed you pictures of green neurons. You'll see it, for some reason, we turn neurons green. Actually, 
You know, 25 years ago, we turned neurons blue. Those of you that are old in biology will realize that we used to turn things blue, and now we turn things green. I don't know what I know what's coming next, but uh, but it's all green now. And even if it's not green, we make it look green. I mean, it turns out we have green proteins we can express red, yellow, and then we always portray them as if they're green. But that that's what we do. Um, and so. These synapses that exist uh, between neurons occur between one neuron that has a, 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 a process called an axon, and that releases a chemical called a neurotransmitter at the synapse to act on the dendrite of a postsynaptic neuron. Now, what's striking is if we repeatedly stimulate neurons, and I'll show you some data from Mahesh Shetty, a postdoc in my lab, that we can do that in a dish in the lab. If we repeatedly stimulate these neurons, all of a sudden these synapses get stronger. There's more transmitter released. There are more receptors for that transmitter. And now this postsynaptic neuron, this dendrite with, it, with its dendritic spine, is more activated. And so this work, the first person to postulate this was a guy named Donald Hebb. Uh, Tim Bliss and Terry Lomo were critical in developing synaptic plasticity. And um, my postdoctoral advisor, Eric Kandel, uh, studied this in both aplesia and mice and connected it uh, to memory. So these 120 years of research in memory has given us, well, it gave, it, it gave Ebbinghaus a 330-page paper, which is pretty heroic, actually. Uh, that happened to also be in German. I, I, don't, I think if it were translated to English, it might be like 250 or something. But, the, uh, but uh, still, it's a 300-page it's a paper. Typically, we nowadays publish four- or six-page papers, not 300-page papers. And he did it on experiments on himself, by the way. So if we ever say we need money for research, just say do the research on yourself and write a 300-page paper, uh, and you'll start a new field like uh, memory research. Anyway, there are three fundamental properties of memory that I've tried to highlight. There are multiple stages of memory, uh, encoding or learning, consolidation and retrieval, multiple types of memory. I focused on episodic memory in the hippocampus, and it is the connections between neurons and how they change synaptic strength that mediates memory. Now, my, my lab in all of this and my work has focused on this process of consolidation, how it is that after you learn, you can continue to modify your memories. There are some striking examples of this that can be emotional or other serious. What, what we have focused on is this idea that in our experiments, we train animals and then we test them 24 hours later. And I've shown this schematically that one of the things animals are doing in that 24-hour time period is sleeping. And with the, uh, with the initial ideas from Laurel Graves, an MD-PhD student in my lab at uh, Penn, who is now a child psychiatrist, and Alan Pack, at the time the director of the Sleep Research Center at Penn, we began to explore how it is that sleep might mediate the consolidation and storage of memories. Now, sleep is not the inactive period that you might, you might think. It's a very, very active period for our brains. During sleep, our brains are in two different states, and those change across the night, uh, non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Early in the night for human subjects, non-REM predominates. That's what is sort of a deeper sleep. And uh, later, in the, uh, more in the morning, it is REM sleep uh, that predominates. One thinks of REM sleep as quote unquote dreaming sleep, although that is uh, not, not, not exactly true. One striking thing that you might think that sleep is a property of, of animals throughout the animal, through, of animals throughout the kingdom, all the different kingdoms of animals, and also obviously humans have been fascinated by it for long periods of time. But REM sleep was only discovered in the 50s, and one of the co discoverers of it was a medical student at the University of Chicago. Uh, it's uh, pretty striking. So there's reason to keep going into the lab, which is, uh, you know, if you were to say tomorrow I'm going to discover a process like REM sleep, that's, uh, that's pretty striking. Now, each of these stages of sleep uh, have electrical signals in the brain that are characterized by particular properties. Uh, during REM sleep, it's a consistent rhythm called a theta rhythm. Interestingly enough, this is exactly what happens in an animal that's exploring an environment. During non-REM sleep, the deep sleep is, is characterized by these so-called slow waves, but there are also spindles and sharp waves that are very, very fast periods of activity, rapid activity. 
So what my lab is focused on is this idea that sleep might mediate memory consolidation, and in particular, that the brain may replay experiences during sleep, and that that may enable uh, the storage of memories. So we've been talking and sitting for quite some time, and uh, it's, it's now time for a, an audience participation uh, part of the talk, if you all are game. So uh, if you are able, we're going to do this thing called the sleepometer, which is to see how much you slept last night. Now, this is particularly complicated because the clocks changed, right? So you have to figure out, like, what happened. Like, my phone changed time, but the, the, the other little dinky clock I have next to my bed so I don't check my email did not. And so when I woke up, I did not have a sense of actually what time it was. So if you, if you are able and, and if you would like, if you could stand up, and then we'll have you sit down depending on how much, how much you have slept. So if you could stand up, if you're not able to stand up, ra uh, you can raise your hand if you would like. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where people uh, are in terms of their sleep last night. So firstly, if you didn't sleep last night, uh, sit down. Uh, so you can take a nap and remember, <laughs> remember what I said. <laughs> so um, so if, you, if you slept six hours or less, uh, sit down. Okay, so that, that's not bad. That's, that's below average. It's about 6.8 hours uh, is the average in the U.S. Uh, if you slept seven hours, uh, sit down. How about eight hours? Sit down if you slept eight hours. Anybody more than eight hours? Uh, so, so a few, a few gold medal sleepers. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. You can all, all sit now. Thanks a lot. Glad to see that we have some gold medal sleepers. So if you look at the sleep meter here, you'll see that the average now is 6.8 hours. In the 50s, it was 8 hours. And the important thing, one of the important things is at the top of this, you'll see that uh, school-age students need 10 hours and infants need a bazillion hours. I can't even uh, read it from here, but it, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of sleep. Those of you that had slept more than eight hours or nine hours, I, I jokingly refer to as gold medal sleepers after Michaela Schifrin, who is a, a, a gold medal a slalom a skier from the United States. She just recently won another uh, a race in the early season of this year. And she was well known for sleeping nine, nine hours a night, and she's also famous for napping on the side of the, of the slope. So I'm not sure how that correlates to her success, but uh, it's interesting. And it's a fun reason to read The New Yorker, too. It's not exactly what you would expect as a factoid from The New Yorker. So those are, the, those are the good things about sleep. Now, obviously, sleep loss uh, causes, uh, causes a large number of car crashes, uh, in, uh, industrial accidents uh, from Chernobyl to Exxon Valdez oil spill to a Metro North derailment um, uh, outside of New York. And so, so sleep loss has uh, dramatic consequences. And those consequences aren't just in those accidents. We all have experienced the stress of sleep loss uh, when uh, and, and even, even more so uh, with COVID and, and the, the difficulties that we have for that. So how can we test what sleep does and how it plays a role in memory storage? So we've done that uh, by looking at, at uh, by, by doing this approach called sleep deprivation. And so we've taken mice during this period of consolidation and kept them awake. Uh, that's consisted largely of, rather than administering caffeine uh, to the medicals, to the, to the mice themselves, we administer caffeine to our grad students and, and undergraduates, and then they keep the mice awake. So it's sort of an indirect caffeine administration. Um, Here's an example of one experiment from uh, two postdocs in my lab, Robert Havkus, who's now at the uh, University of Groningen, and uh, Jen Tudor, who's now at St. Joe's University. And what they did was to go back to this object task I've been showing all along. And what they did was train animals with objects in three locations, and then either sleep deprive them or allow them to sleep. And then, then move one of these objects. This green cylinder has moved in, in space and is now in a different location. An animal that remembers these locations will explore this displaced object more. And so that's reflected by non-sleep deprived animals with this 45% exploration. Animals that are sleep deprived though just explore all of the objects equally at 33% and that reflects uh, no memory. So this brief period of sleep deprivation, uh, if you're keeping score, it turns out mice sleep about 11 hours a day or, a, or in 24 hour period. And, um, so five hours is about half of that time frame. So that's as if we had four hours of sleep in one night. And, and in this case, they're not able to remember. Now, what about the cellular properties that I talked about? 
these synaptic connections. So we can study those by taking slices of the mouse brain and putting them in a, a chamber where we can maintain them alive uh, for about 24 hours. This is the work of Mahesh Shetty, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And what we can do in these slices is uh, place electrodes on the slices, one of which stimulates the neurons and the other records from them and we can record a baseline response. And so the synaptic transmission we record is shown here by this part of the trace, this downgoing part of the trace. Now, if we repeatedly activate these slices, that's meant to mimic learning, and then we come back and stimulate again, now we see this response is much greater. And so this reflects a process called synaptic plasticity. It's a cellular model of memory. It's, it's in a sense, learning in a dish. And so what Mahesh asked, he asked, well, what happens if we take hippocampal slices from sleep-deprived animals? Well, he found that their basal synaptic transmission, shown here, uh, looked normal. But after repeated stimulation, they did not show this increase the way uh, control slices did. So sleep deprivation impacts memory, and it also impacts synaptic plasticity within the hippocampus. What about these connections between neurons that I referred to before, these synapses? We can, we can look with imaging techniques at what are called dendritic spines. So dendritic spines are these portions of the dendrite, these protuberances that are a connection between the axon and the dendrite. And we can see them in these, uh, these stained neurons if we look at high magnification. I don't know how clear it is here, but there are little little protuberances coming off of this neuron, and we can literally see these dendritic spines. We can also stain them with a lower tech stain called a Golgi stain, and there we can also count, uh, count, count spines. What we found, what Robert Havkus in my lab found, was that sleep deprivation led to a 30 to 40 percent reduction in dendritic spines and also a shrinkage of the length of dendrites. And so this is only five hours of sleep deprivation. So this is like only sleeping four hours last night and it leads to this change in the connections between neurons and the brain. Now, there is some good news in this. The good news is if after sleep deprivation we let animals sleep, and have what is called recovery sleep. In this case, they had three hours of recovery sleep. Those dendritic spines and the length of those dendrites was back to normal. So there's a plasticity in our brain. So it's a good idea to catch up on our sleep in terms of recovery sleep. Now, this is all about what sleep deprivation does. What about sleep itself? So there's been a couple of very striking experiments that I'll finish my talk with uh, from a number of other investigators that have looked at how sleep might mediate memory storage. This first is in rodents, uh, an experiment first carried out by Matt Wilson uh, when he was uh, at the University of Arizona. He's now at MIT. We're collaborating with Cameron Deba in a grant funded by the National Institute of Men Mental Health. Cameron is at Michigan uh, to study these processes uh, in mice. These individuals look at, at cells called play cells. Now, play cells were discovered by John O'Keefe, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in the a few years ago for this uh, discovery, and they reflect, in, in this diagram as shown schematically here, there is a colored uh, dots. Those colored dots reflect the activity of a different neuron. So there's one neuron here reflected as this sort of pink, another that is yellow, one that is kind of this uh, light green, another dark green. And so you can see that each of these neurons only fire when an animal is in a particular place in space. So these are a sort of spatial code, a kind of navigation system uh, for the rodent. And so these play cells can be studied when an animal is exploring an environment, and then they can be recorded during sleep. And what researchers have found is that these neurons fire in a particular pattern, here blue before green and then red and then orange. But they found that during non-REM sleep, it is the same order of firing, blue, then green, then red, then orange, in what seems to reflect what has been called a replay or reactivation. Now, interestingly enough, this can be faster than real life. It, by the way, can also be backwards, which is kind of interesting if you think about what happens uh, to some of your dreams, right, which might, might be sped up or, or, or even backwards. So this is, I think, a really striking observation of how it is that sleep might activate neural circuits in the brain to enable memories to be actively stored. Now, what about humans? Uh, Pierre McKay at the University of Liège used uh, PET imaging 
uh, to measure cerebral blood flow. And what he did was to have human subjects navigate a virtual environment. And he recorded activity and an activation of the hippocampus in those individuals. He then had them sleep in a PET imager, which is a feat in and of itself. And he found that there, during non-REM sleep, there was activation of the hippocampus. And that the more activation he observed in the hippocampus, the, which is in this axis, the better the human subjects did uh, on this virtual maze the next day. So this feels a bit like the interpretation of dreams uh, that Sigmund Freud described, where we have uh, this, this uh, learning something and then uh, perhaps uh, dreaming about it. Now what about modifying this activity? Jan Born at the University of Tübingen uh, did an experiment uh, where this is a paper in science that actually starts with Proust, which is kind of wild, and, and the Madeleine, the tasting of the Madeleine. What Jan did was, you, what Jan did was to use an odor and he used a rose odor, quite literally. And he trained subjects in a task that is like a task of concentration, where when we, the, there's this particular object in two locations in this uh, card, and uh, you need to remember those two locations. And he did that in the presence of this rose odor. Then when individuals were asleep, he exposed that odor during non-REM sleep, and then subsequently tested their memory. And what he found over here on the right is that individuals that had received this odor during learning and specifically non-REM sleep had better memory for this concentration task. It wasn't true if they did it in REM sleep. It wasn't true if they did it in wakefulness. So it's particularly this stage of memory called non-REM sleep or even more specifically slow wave sleep. So what I've tried to tell you today in this talk is that our, the, the tools of neuroscience that have been developed to study memory and sleep in both uh, experimental animals and in human subjects has really enabled us to answer questions that have perplexed philosophers and scientists and biologists for centuries. First question is, why do we sleep? Well, one answer to that, there are several answers to that, but one answer to that is that sleep enables us to store memories of our waking experiences. The second is, why do we dream? Quite literally, neural circuits in our brain are wired to replay our waking experiences. And so we can go from, from mice and synaptic spines to EEG and play cells and provide insight into the interpretation of dreams and the remembrance of things past. So I want to finish with some thanks. Uh, the first thanks and a quote from the Iowa Neuroscience Institute. We have some shirts here in the front row, the, the back of which say the best ideas from, from collaboration. So if you got, no, you're so well done. So, uh, and they do. I first want to thank my, my parents who are, are listening um, on, another, on another shore. My mom passed away uh, New Year's Eve. And here, they are relieved by the fact that I have finally finished school at age 30. So that's, that's a big relief. Uh, here's my wife and son, uh, Noreen and Seamus, at a, uh, a football game uh, recently. They, they're uh, uh, in the back there. And the I&I &I office, a tremendous group uh, of Megan and Sam, and I believe Mary is here, who have helped me, uh, have me uh, develop the Neuroscience Institute. We have an extraordinary group of, of, of funders from the NIH to the Simons Foundation, and particularly the Carver Charitable Trust and the Carver College of Medicine that have enabled this to be possible. And then to finish, I would like to thank my lab. Here in a socially distanced a uh, picture that looks like we're either going to start singing Hamilton or become a flash mob. So I'm not really sure what, what we're going to do, but we were distanced. Um, what I would like to do as we finish is just ask if any of my lab members are here. I know that uh, several are over here. If you all could stand up so we can, we can thank, thank you. If you would, please, I need to thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Marie, you're there. You count. Marie, you count, too. Oops, sorry. Anyway, thanks, thanks so much for... Thanks so much for all that, all that you do uh, every day to enable me to, uh, to give talks like this and to try to read Freud in the original German and fail miserably. Uh, I, I will honestly say my wife did fine with the Proust in the French and I failed on the German. So the Bren Mawr liberal arts education uh, wins. Uh, not so sure about Swarthmore, but uh, anyway. Um, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your attention. I'm not sure where we stand in terms of being able to take questions, but I'm happy to take questions.
Thank you so much, Ted. That was fabulous. And I know we have lots of questions. I hope we have lots of questions. So please take a moment and, and fill out your card. And don't forget to put your, put your email address on there in case we don't get to your questions. And I would encourage even the lab folks to ask. Uh, now's your chance, right? Here's, <laughs> here he is. You could just ask the most interesting question you've always wanted to ask. And you don't have to put your email down if you don't want to. Um, <laughs> That was really fabulous. Thank you so much. So I'm going to start with a few questions that people have already asked in advance of your talk, Ted. Uh, one of the questions um, th that your fascinating research raises is what happens when we lose memories? You're focused on how we, how we keep memories and how important sleep is, but what happens when we lose memories, both in normal life and in aging, and, uh, and even with neurodegenerative disorders? So I, I think there's one thing that's important to, to uh, think about is I've uh, talked about memories as if they're just stored and then simply retrieved. When we think we've lost memories, sometimes we've lost our ability to retrieve them, and we can experience that transiency of trying to remember the name, somebody's name that comes back with time. So there's, there's, there's two ways that we kind of lose memories. One is by uh, having difficulty retrieving them. But, but as, we, as we age, and particularly with neurodegeneration, we literally have loss of these dendritic spines that I've talked about, sometimes as an initial stage, and then um, loss of the neurons themselves in the later stages of the disease. One interesting thing that I didn't have time to talk about is uh, neurodegenerative diseases are characterized by particular changes in sleep-wake states. And Parkinson's disease, which we think of as a motor disorder, but that also has cognitive components, it can first be seen in many patients by what's called REM behavior disorder, by actually acting out uh, during your sleep, sometimes punching the person next to you. And uh, about that can happen some 10 years before Parkinson's might be diagnosed. So there's not just a connection with memory in these disorders, but also with sleep. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, another question, what about intentionally wiping out memories? Is that something that we know how to do with neuroscience tools? There are a lot of people that talk about um, PTSD and disorders right. of trauma. So are, are any researchers looking at how we would actually get rid of memories? Intentionally, so I, obviously, that's been uh, you know thought of in a number of movies and uh, and and ways to do that. We um, we're much better at modifying. If you'll notice the behaviors I talked about at the beginning, driving sleep, driving feeding, were behaviors that were kind of instantaneous behaviors. Whereas what I talked about for the rest of my talk was uh, the result of experience that are long-lasting changes in the brain, and those changes are much harder to understand. There there was some encouraging data. Uh, with what was called a property called reconsolidation, and that was studied in animals. But the work in, and there was a large number of work in humans, but it has actually not really panned out. So the answer is uh, we don't, which might be a good thing. <laughs> okay. All right. You briefly mentioned that emotional state can influence memory formation and consolidation. What do we know from research about how that works? emotional state and how it affects memory. So I've talked a lot about this brain region called the hippocampus, which is much more about episodes and facts and events. What I haven't talked about is a brain region called the amygdala that, um, that other, uh, that actually the Damasio has also identified a patient with a selective lesion in the amygdala. And, and that individual had difficulties with fear. And um, so we definitely have, uh, so the amygdala does kind of shade our memories. And I was recently watching um, uh, Inside Out again, and it was kind of interesting because there's some examples where there's a joy and a sad, and sad actually touches some of the memories and they become sad. And those can, those can happen. I mean, this can sort of change, our memories change with time, and circuits like the amygdala can drive that. Thank you. What about memories that might be disrupted by having to get up in the middle of the night to, for example, go to the restroom. I won't quote who asked this, but I can really relate to that. Um, or any other multiple interruptions during sleep. So I think for sure the, the, the uh, interruptions in sleep are, are, uh, are uh, you know, a challenge. One of the things that I've talked about, our, our 
sleep in humans, we're really, you'll notice I talked about very specific uh, memory for learning these locations of car, of, of items or, or in exploring an environment. Most of what we know comes from repeated uh, uh, tests and repeated learning of like, how we might uh, navigate in Iowa City or something. It's more like the test, for example, and, and not, to, not to pick on Seamus, but for his environmental studies uh, test tomorrow, that's where you want to sleep well tonight so he can, uh, can remember the, the facts he's trying to cram in his, in his brain. Right. This one is good. Uh, why, as we're aging, do we remember childhood memories but not recent events? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, that, is a great, that is a great question. So one of the things that I, I talked about, if you'll notice, the memories I talked about were all memories that were relatively recent. So the tests were all done the next day. Um, and those memories are mediated by the hippocampus, but over time, uh, memories become distributed throughout the cortex and th that over in the, the main part of the brain and the hippocampus. And so what happens as we age is that uh, our hippocampus is particularly vulnerable to loss. And so that sort of leaves us with our cortex, which is the kind of older memory. So that's at least one, one explanation for it. How do you know the effects of sleep deprivation were due to this rather than the stress associated with the procedure? <laughs> So that's a, that's a, that's a question we, we always get, and, uh, and it's a good question. And the field has worked in several ways to dissociate them. Um, mainly the ways we've, we've worked is to dissociate measures of stress, like uh, corticosterone, which is a stress hormone, and to show that there are cases in which you can have high, that, that the sleep deprivation we, we do doesn't relate, give high levels of those stress hormones. And if we remove, for example, the adrenal glands that release those stress hormones, the animals are still sensitive to the effects of sleep deprivation. So it's not a one-to-one -one matching, but there probably isn't, I mean, honestly, there probably is an aspect of stress to the finding. Um, and we've been able to develop, I didn't talk about them today, but we've been able to develop essentially some treatments for our mice where we can make it so that they, they don't know they've been sleep deprived, uh, which is very interesting. And that doesn't change responses to stress. So that suggests that they're different. Uh, but they're not completely different. They're overlapping. Got it. Here's a good question. Why did you go into neuroscience? It's a personal question. Yeah, that's great. So it's actually very, it's, it's interesting and it's, kind of timely for people that are trainees. I was, I was always fascinated by the brain. I actually have a brain from a dissection I did in AP Bio, which was in like 1979. Uh, so that's a little, little funny. So you know I was interested in the brain. And when we were moving uh, uh, here, I found all my old papers. And um, one was a, a, a paper on the action potential from AP Bio. And another was my application to Swarthmore where we had to fill in uh, possible profession, which actually said neurochemist, which is crazy. Like, it's exactly what I am. But then I got, uh, to be honest with you, I got very, very... You were how old when you filled that application out? Like, uh, how old were you? How old was I? Yeah. Um, seven, seven, 16. 16. Yeah. So what's funny, though, is I went really into molecular biology. I went into kind of another field. And that's partially because when I was in college, there wasn't a neuroscience major. There wasn't a neuroscience course at Swarthmore. And so um, I went and learned the tools of molecular biology. And then what I realized as a, uh, as a, as a grad student, I cloned a, a gene in Drosophila, and another variant of it was being studied in memory. And I remember going, it was being studied in memory lab at MIT, I was at Harvard. I went to the Kendall Square tea shop, uh, see a, a tea, tea uh, stop, and we exchanged uh, DNA clones, uh, this guy Jerry Yin and I. So a very strange thing. But, um, but it was doing that where I realized that um, what, I was, what I was studying, all the molecular work I was doing, could be applied to the, to the brain. And so it was as a postdoc then where I really started doing that. But even that was technically driven. We were making uh, different kinds of genetically mal uh, modified mouse lines that at the time was, uh, was, was at the cutting edge of what the field was doing. Uh, and so it has a lot to do with techniques. But one of the things that I wonder about is what would have happened if I had really realized this neuroscience interest, you know, because it's sort of there uh, latently, but then didn't come out until uh, my postdoc time. That's great. How is it, how important is it to remember or record our dreams? 
So that's a, that's a good question. I have to say, honestly, in, in, putting this talk together had me think about dreams a lot more. I, uh, I, I didn't really think about them much. I mean, I th think about them, but not, not in, in critical ways. I, that's, a, that's a question. Uh, you know, one of the people you have a quote from, Thomas Nicol Yakshad, is uh, my, I joke, I, uh, uh, a friend who's also a psychiatrist. So we might have to consult him about that. We can, we can do that during the reception. <laughs> All right, what causes epilepsy? My sister has had it all her life. She had surgery 25 years ago, and seizures seem to stop, but she may be having them again. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a more of a mouse doctor than a human, not a human doctor at all, but, but <laughs> epilepsy is caused by changes in the excitability of neurons, and um, those happen for a variety of reasons, either... Um, uh, genetic or environmental or from uh, some, some experience. Uh, and one of the things that can happen is the susceptibility to seizures can vary with sleep-wake states. So you actually have to be uh, uh, pay attention to that in terms of thinking about uh, a, a, a patient with epilepsy. Thank you. Do we know anything about why some people seem to have very good and accurate memory while others seem to be forgetful? Um, yeah. So we've been we've actually been trying to study that we've studied that in mice and we have a number of mice that we have uh, created that uh, have better memories and in fact when I was uh, uh, starting my lab and finishing my postdoc starting at Penn I, I coined this term called memory suppressor gene that there would be a, a gene that would normally uh, uh, suppress memories and indeed there there are so there are genes that you can modify that uh, increase memories. But um, we've been studying it here in the context of twice exceptional individuals with the Bell and Blank Center, with Susan Asseline. So there's a group, uh, Susan Asseline, Jake Michelson, Thomas Nicol Yakshad, and myself have been working to try to understand uh, gifted individuals, and in particular, gifted individuals that also have uh, a diagnosis of autism or ADHD. And there, what we're seeing is that if you think about the measure of IQ, it's a measure that has several different components that, ra that range from processing speed to spatial reasoning to, to uh, verbal comprehension. And what you can see is that different, each aspect of the IQ seems to go with having, being gifted and whether you have autism or ADHD or not. And one of the most important things is verbal comprehension and also processing speed really stands out. So we're hoping that through that process, pro, pro, project, we can identify the neural circuits that are, that are mediating those different strengths and, and understand that. We just, hopefully it's due tomorrow, an autism center of excellence. I, I think it's going in. So Jake Michelson is putting a network in. We've gotten education schools and uh, neuroscientists at, uh, here at Iowa, at uh, UCLA, at Vanderbilt, at Johns Hopkins, and at the University of Connecticut together for that project. Thank you. All right. If it's not a dream, it's a memory, then how are dreams different from waking memories? Often in dreams, we seem to combine things in our memories in unusual ways. Why doesn't that happen during waking memories, which are more ac and which are more accurate? So one thing that is, is interesting in that regard is um, REM sleep, which I talked about. Actually, during REM sleep, parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, are firing as if an animal was walking around an environment. But obviously, the animal isn't. And so the key difference there is the difference in the connection of the brain to the periphery in this brain region called the called a thalamus, which um, normally brings our sensory information in from the periphery to uh, uh, to reach the brain. But that changes during sleep because of changes in these electrical oscillations. So the real answer to that is there is this sort of disconnect, literally a disconnect of circuits to the outside world uh, between the brain and the outside world. And so that's one reason why we're not getting the, uh, the feedback and the sensory input. The other thing is that these uh, circuits are firing at different patterns than they normally would. And so one of the things I noted was that that replay or reactivation can be faster than normal during wakefulness, and it can also be in reverse. And so there's um, different uh, rules, apparently, and, uh, the, of, the electrical, of the neural circuits, and that's because there's different activity of the proteins that control those neural circuits during sleep as opposed to wakefulness. Interesting. 
How does chronic sleep deprivation impact memory formation, or can the density of dendrite spines recover after chronic sleep deprivation? So that's actually, a, that, hopefully that's from my, one of my lab members. It might need, be. That's an experiment that we need to do. So we should, we should not be here. We should be doing that experiment. <laughs> you can take so, a little time off on Sunday. Anyway, so the one thing that I will point to is actually if you, there's been some imaging studies in uh, human patients with insomnia, so chronic sleep loss. And they actually have a smaller hippocampus than patients without, uh, that are not insomniacs. So there is some data from human subjects and it's worrisome because it's, and it turns out there's different sub pieces of the hippocampus and it's exactly where we would predict from our work. Um, and so I don't know that there would be compensation. I think there would be an impact. Interesting. What does dementia do to the hippocampus? So dementia, patients with dementia, I mean in the early stages of dementia, um, the parts of the, there's parts of the cortex that are affected and then the hippocampus is, get, is, most, is hit and in the individuals with dementia, the hippocampus is, uh, functions less well, usually is smaller with fewer dendritic spines. So it's, it's impacted directly. Interesting. Do, is there any research on people who take medication to sleep and how that might affect memory development and uh, creation? Yeah, there are, there are some. So it turns out that the, the, the drugs that we take to encourage us to sleep drive particular stages of sleep. And while I've focused on non-REM sleep here, one of the important aspects of sleep is that it has these two components, non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Even non-REM sleep has three or four different um, uh, types within it. So you really need all the types and the drugs that we take only only give us one or two of the types. They don't give us all the kinds of sleep. And there's a there's sort of a natural progression of sleep across the night, which is also something we see. If we're always waking up at 4 a.m., even if it's to get to the gym, which wouldn't be a, a necessarily a bad thing, what you're essentially doing is cutting off the, REM, the time when you would get REM sleep. And so you're changing the Distribution of sleep. Yeah, stages. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. If the purpose of dreams is to relive events and consolidate memories, why are dreams so often nonsensical? That's a really good question. Yeah. Because mine surely. So are. that is, that is there is there is some theories that dreams are a way in which um, we our brain tries things out. Um, which I'm not sure what the support is for that. That's a little <laughs> flaky. Um, I need more to more than water probably to think some more about that. But uh, interesting. So this is my own question: How in the world did we get you to come to the University of Iowa? Well, I believe Jean Robillard uh, is is, he, is here he's back somewhere. There, somewhere. We're, we're, yes, um, there so, he is, right there. Yeah. So Jean and Renee. So. Um, the, the, no, but it's a, it's, this is an outstanding, this is an outstanding and an astonishing place. I, I continue, I mean, I spent my life on the East Coast and some time in Europe, and uh, I visited um, Mark Blumberg before I started interviewing for the uh, Iowa Neuroscience Institute position. But, uh, but what I found to coming here is, um, is, is extraordinary people, uh, outstanding facilities, and, and people that are interested in collaboration and connection. And, and I've seen that from across the university. We were talking earlier about Chris Merrill runs the International Writers Workshop. Right. And it's striking that we would, set, we would start off a conversation. Um, and, and the conversation came from his interest in in reflecting disability in writing and, and writing about pe having people that are, are disabled write about their experiences. And I could talk about the neuroscience of that with him. <coughs> and that's something that, that we've been able to do and to uh, really accomplish across the university. And so what, what, I, what I thought was true when I started visiting uh, turned out to be exactly the case. And even more so now that I see um, what we've been able to develop, like these new centers for developmental disabilities, and also one uh, for Parkinson's disease, all of which is emerging. Just a, a, a lot of creative people who are interested in doing that, their creativity together, like the piano and clarinet that we heard earlier. You need both of them to uh, have the emotional experience of those pieces. And we have that connection at Iowa. 
Well, you couldn't have said it better, and I can't say it any better. Ted, thank you so much for, for being our presidential lecturer today. And please, all of you, I hope you'll, after we give him a round of applause, join us for a, a reception in the back of the room. Let's give Ted a big round of applause.